we're moving to the field of laser trapping and cooling. We all learn that light has a momentum, but uh, can it be used to manipulate objects? Arthur Ashkin uh, will talk to us about the early days of laser trapping and manipulation of particles by lasers. I consider it a pretty great honor to be invited to speak at this symposium. Jim was my friend and he was a colleague. Uh, I was asked to speak about uh, what I did with Jim Gordon in the early days of laser trapping. And now I consider this work to be the most interesting and important work of my whole career. Its origin, however, goes back a long ways, 70 years to the start of World War II in 1941. Not many people were around there from me out in the audience. I was 20 years old at that time and a sophomore physics major at Columbia College. I was a good student and they offered me a job with a deferment to work at the recently formed Columbia Radiation Lab. I was their first technician. <laughs> My draft board in Brooklyn, however, saw things a little bit differently and I was promptly drafted. Well, I ended up serving a total of about six years in the Army at the radiation lab until 1947. At the lab, there was a guy, Sid Millman. You Bell Labs people know him. He was the inventor of the rising sun magnetron. He was my mentor. And he really taught me how to be an experimental physicist. Melman had me build in 1944 a high power X band magnetron, three centimeters. It had a record power output of about a megawatt. Okay. I built it, but it was never used in the war. Uh, but I did have a little fun with the magnetron. I did an experiment demonstrating light pressure. Now, this was never published but it did alert me to the subject. After the war, I graduated from Columbia College and I got a PhD in nuclear physics in 1952 from Cornell, okay? Now with Millman's help, I got a job at Bell Labs in a microwave department. And meanwhile, as we've all heard here previously, Jim was finning, finishing up his famous experiment with uh, Professor Towns, and he also took a job at, Colum at uh, the same group. Now, our careers at Bell Labs were initially quite different. <laughs> Mine started badly. My department head asked me to demonstrate a theory he had about canceling noise. On electron beams, this is, okay. We were a microwave tube group, and uh, this was a physical impossibility, and I, of course, failed. So after a year, I ended up almost fired and no raise, okay? Fortunately, my department had saved me, and eventually I found my own way at Bell Labs. I worked on a lot of things in the, uh, in the 50s. I studied electron beams and magnetic fields, and electron beam parametric amplifiers. We heard about Louis Zell. Well, I did the experiments that Louis Zell used in his book, his well-known book. But Jim's career was very much more focused. He concentrated on masons and later on la on masons, later on lasers, and he was quickly promoted to be a department head, and he assembled a very uh, impressive group that did much of the early work, as you've just heard, and more, okay? And in 1963, finally, after 10 years, I was promoted to department head, and I had mostly technicians and shop people in my group. So this gave me a rather late start on laser work. Well, I actually got my start by attending an Optical Society meeting in 1969, okay? I heard a talk on something called runners and bouncers. You probably never heard of that, but there was 
strange small particles that people would see inside of cavity resonators that would go zipping back and forth, running and bouncing. Now, they, it was speculated that this might be radiation pressure. It turned out it wasn't. It, that, it, it turned out to be actually a radiometric effect, just plain old heat. But this reminded me of my magnetron days, and I asked myself, could I take a laser and actually make a, 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 a push and make uh, observe light pressure on small transparent particles in water. That would be, in water there would be very little heat, maybe we'd see it. Well, the experiment worked almost immediately. The little spheres zipped around through the water, and then I noticed some strange behavior. Okay, I'm an experimentalist, it happened. Particles were being pulled into the high intensity region of the laser beam as they were pushed along. And when they hit the output face, they were impaled on the output face. They stayed there. Well, it occurred to me that I could make an optical trap if I took away the wall and put a second beam in the opposite direction. Uh, let's see if, they, if this uh, slide shows that. Yeah. Uh, the geometry is shown on the right. If you move the, that little sphere in any direction, there's a storing force, so that it's stable. Now, the, uh, the optics is very simple. They would show on the left a Gaussian beam and uh, a couple of rays going through the sphere. Uh, there's more power on the A side than the B side, and uh, the forces are in the direction of the momentum change and they have components driving it forward and pulling it in, okay? So they're very simple optics, first trap. But that was a very uh, break breakthrough moment for me, and I think to the history of optical trapping. Okay. Now, I even speculated, I decided I was going to write this up. I speculated that uh, maybe you could even trap atoms. Atoms are just little spheres, dielectric, and maybe even biological particles. But they'd probably be all burnt to pieces. But anyway, I wrote my results to, for, for PhysRev letters. And at Bell Labs at that time, if you wrote a result, wrote a paper going for, to PhysRev letters, they had an internal review system and had to go to the theoretical physics department to check out, check out its, uh, whether it was uh, destroying the reputation of the laboratory. Well, uh, the review came back and it was rejected. Rejected on four grounds. Number one, no new physics, okay? <laughs> number two, <laughs> let's see, yeah. Oh, number two. Uh, it's not even wrong. <laughs> that, that's a form of the Pauli insult. When Pauli found something that was particularly trivial, trivial he used that insult. Okay. And on number three, it said it could be published somewhere. And number four, but not in Fizz Revenants. Okay. So I was very upset. But our director, Rudy Kompfer, you may not know him, he's the inventor of the traveling wave too. People call it traveling wave masers nowadays. But anyway, he was a very mild-mannered man. And when he heard of the rejection, he simply said, damn it, send it in. So we sent it in, and it was accepted. Okay? And it turns out that is the one of the most, uh, I, I, I've been told this, I suppose it's true, that it's one of the citation classics in the, uh, in the physical society. Okay. But uh, I followed up with a number of experiments and proposals using, uh, using uh, trapping. And I suggested devices like uh, atomic beam velocity analyzers and atomic beam isotope separators. All these things work. An important paper, however, was a Hench and Shallow paper. That was, a, that was proposed that you could use uh, uh, atom damping, uh, well, using atom damping from the 
use the Doppler shift uh, and radiation pressure. Uh, that's, a, that's a very familiar device, but uh, there was only one reference in the paper, and that was to me. And they never even mentioned trapping atoms, okay? So they weren't that all interested. Now, most experiments in the early 70s and 80s were on micron-sized micron dielectric spheres, however. Well, we studied levitation against gravity. You're trying to beam up and Let's see, let's look, see if there's a, there's a picture there. Yeah, there you see a, a beam holding a sphere up against gravity. Okay, that was the first levitation experiment. I submitted this phys to uh, applied physics laws, came back rejected. Why? It's been done before, okay? But the guy could never come up with the exact reference, so the editor accepted the paper, all right? Now, with this kind of thing, I show you there that uh, if you look at the, at the sphere and s sense its position, you could make what I call the force. Well, so I, I, what I'm saying is that we use the, uh, 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 a, a, a sensor to uh, stabilize, feedback stabilize the particle in, a pos in one position. If, the, if you apply a force and the force changes, well, the feedback system changes the input power so that the input power is a measure of the force. So that's a force measuring instrument. And we use it to make uh, a very precise optical Millikan oil drop experiment. Okay, now maybe we'll look at the next. Yeah, this shows how the, how the particle is staying fixed and all those little steps represent single electron events that are taking place over time as you shine in some UV light. There's tremendous resolution there, and you notice there's no, no third electrons. So that was a, that was a question. Uh, in the early days, people thought that the charge on the electron was, uh, was not even fixed. Uh, there's a guy, Herrenhoft, who, uh, he's the inventor of radiometric effects, but so uh, I think this was an important experiment. Uh, let's see. Why, what do I want to say now? Oh, we did a lot of experiments of this sort. Whoops, I, then let's go on. Here. I, I thought, well, let's look at the uh, weight of dependence of the force. That's, you see how the power, levita power levitation varies as a wavelength. We had a dye laser. We swept it across the, uh, whole, the whole, uh, uh, over a wavelength region. And looking, looking at uh, uh, the spectrum A, it looks pretty garbage. Yeah, we, I thought, well, maybe the apparatus is not working. But if you take another, put another particle in and compare uh, spectrum B to spectrum A, you notice it's identical, except it's shifted. And it's shifted because it has a different size. This is, these are resonances. So these are surface wave resonances. And it, with these kind of measurements, you can measure the size of a sphere, the diameter, to one part in 10 to the eighth, or even higher. And you can measure the index of refraction to that kind of accuracy. So. Uh, Millikan's uh, measurement was never used in the, for the charge of the electron. He, in fact, he got it wrong. But I think this is, has, has the uh, potential of being a very important experiment. Now, in 1978, time is moving on. I invented the, uh, the optical tweezer trap for macroscopic particles. Let's see if we see something. Oh, oh, let's see. I just, oh, I just want to show you this very quickly. What? If you look at that picture on the other side, right there, the big screen. Oh, okay. Go to your left and look down at that screen. Okay. Well, I can look at this side and see it too. Well, okay, the audience is here and there. Come on, don't hide from that. 
All right, all right, look, look at these pictures. These are, these are, these are uh, a comparison between theoretical and experimental light scattering uh, 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 spectra. The top one is theoretical, calculated from me theory, using computers. They didn't have computers in the old days, and four spheres, and this is optical wavelength. And look at the comparison between the top and the bottom. Almost perfect. I think this is the most precise light scattering experiment ever done. And if you want to think of it that way, I think it confirms Maxwell's theory. In, right? OK. But now let me tell you that Jim Gordon was always a supporter of light force experiments. I spoke to him a lot in the early days. And eventually, we became collaborators. In 1980, Gordon and Ashkin showed that one could indeed nominally, tra tra nominal, trap a nom a nominally stable atom optically. Now, uh, using, uh, I'm, I'm a little incoherent, I'm saying we, we, we showed that we could use, with two beams you could trap an atom. One trap, you would make a very deep, tune off, off resonance, make a very deep trap, and with the second beam, you could optimally cool it. So with that combination, you could make traps. Okay? Uh, well, at this point, there was actually no rigorous theory of uh, quant the quantum theory of trapping and cooling. A lot of it was just hand-waving, like I showed you. And Jim decided to develop a theory of, on his own. So he had a number of new features that showed up in this theory. And uh, when the, he wrote up a paper, and I looked at it, showed it to me, he put my name on it. So I told him, I'm, I don't belong on this paper. I can't understand the mathematics. So he said, well, you explain what the problems were. And I solved it, so we collaborated. And he insisted that the name stay on it. And that turned out to be probably the most famous theory paper in the whole field of optical trapping, OK? So I'm very grateful for that. Now, in 1963, uh, a guy called Bill Phillips at the National Bureau of Standards. He was working with a guy called Metcalf, and he was using light pressure to stop atomic beams. All right, you shine, a beam comes here, and, a beam, and you shine light that way. The beam comes to a complete rest. Well, it still has thermal noise and had a temperature of about a degree, OK, a degree Kelvin. Not three degrees, one degree, OK? Well, uh, they were at the bureau. They were very proud of that, and they held a, a, a conference in which uh, Jim and I and John Bjorkholm we were invited. And Bill Phillips gave his presentation. And at the end of the presentation, he said, "And now we're going to next experiment is to trap atoms with light using uh, cooled cooled atoms." And uh, when we got home, I told Jim, you know, oh, he specifically mentioned the trap. He said the trap has recently been published in, uh, in uh, applied in, in, in optics letters. Well, I told Jim that I had actually shown that that trap was leaky. There were directions where the atoms were not stable. The atoms would escape. And then I told him that I also suspected that there was an optical Earnshaw theorem in analogy with the optical Earnshaw theorem on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on uh, electrons that uh, said that maybe there was no such thing as a stable scattering force trap. Well, next day, Jim comes back and says, well, I proved it, OK? So uh, the question is, would we even publish it? Because we would alert Bill Phillips to the fact that uh, uh, the uh, uh, his, 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 
his trap was, uh, was leaky. And finally, we decided to publish it because our, our director, the boss, said uh, that uh, trapping is never going to work, and they're not supporting it. So we, we ended up, we published the theorem, alerted Bill Phillips, and we're sitting back waiting for, uh, for him to get the first optical trap. Well, at that point, a guy showed up from Murray Hill by the name of Steve Chu. He was an atomic physicist. And he started talking to us. And uh, I guess he got interested in trapping. But uh, the boss told him, I won't mention his name, he said, Steve, he says, you can do anything, oh, I'm sorry, you can do anything you want, but don't work with a hard ask and on item trapping, it's never going to work. <laughs> well, Steve had an intuition and uh, he uh, joined us, he dropped his other plans, and we started a collaboration to, to do atom trapping. Well, Steve had the very good idea of first seeing if you could cool atoms using the Henschen shallow uh, uh, Doppler techni technique, and then after, if that succeeded, to proceed with uh, trapping of atoms. Well, that's the way optical molasses, if you know that term, optical molasses was born. And with optical molasses, we made uh, atom trapping, okay? But shortly after, well, we had a moment of fame there because the uh, New York Times, uh, on the Sunday Times, on the front page, mentioned about trapping of uh, atoms with light. But at, at this point, uh, uh, the collaboration sort of disintegrated. People each went his own way. Chu uh, took a job at Stanford, and he took his equipment with him. Leo, Leo Holberg, his, uh, whom you may know, his uh, postdoc, he went to go work at the Bureau of Standards. And uh, Steve's uh, technician, Alex Cable, he quit the labs, Thor Labs, which you may have heard, and he became a millionaire, okay? <laughs> Well, that left me with Joe Dietrich, my technician at Bell Labs, and I stayed there ever since. But we, uh, uh, we had a bit of a breakthrough. Just by accident, we discovered that it's possible to track bacteria, living things. We had a sample uh, of, uh, uh, that we were trapping, and, and it was a good sample, so we said, let's, let's keep it overnight, and we'll continue the experiment in the morning. Next day, we look in, turn on the light, and there's some kind of a wild scattering going on there. And I said to Joe, well, we got bugs. It turned out we did have bugs. The sample had become contaminated with bacteria, and the light beam was trapping the bacteria, okay? And they couldn't escape, so we had this wild scattering. Well, uh, the next thing we did was to, to look at the, at the trapping of, of, of living things with light. We visited all the ponds in the neighborhood, collecting uh, paramecium, rotifers, all kinds of single cell, cell, cell animals. And um, that was the beginning of the use of tweezers in biology, which has grown enormously, okay? Um, there was a, a biophysicist by the name of Steve Block, from Stan who's now at Stanford. He began working on tweezers very early, and he did some of the uh, most marvelous experiments. He, he, he trapped and measured the forces of molecular molecules which drive uh, small particles inside of cells, okay? Oh, by inside of cells. Um, and uh, 
The thing is that optical tweezers could actually work. This was to great surprise to me, could actually work inside of living cells if you use infrared light, because infrared light is less damaging. And we even did little operations moving around the guts of, of, uh, of um, onion cells and things like that. But Steve went on to, sh to study uh, other important molecules like DNA and RAN, RNA polymerase, and he did it at atomic resolution. He found that he, he could make traps so stable, and so controlled, that he could measure the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the genetic code at atomic resolution. Now that's, that, that is a little late for, uh, I mean, people have used uh, a, a force, me force um, microscopy or to, uh, to, to do the first, actually looking at, at atoms on surfaces, but I think that actually the tweezers is, uh, is equally, yeah, should I stop here? <laughs> Uh, I, well, okay, but I, all right, I, uh, I will stop and say just a few things more. I think a lot of Nobel Prizes are in, are going to appear in this field. We've had two, one for trapping of the uh, uh, of atoms and cooling. The other one was Bose-Einstein condensation. The final remark would be to cut through a lot of this is that tweezers has turned out to be a very important trap for studying Bose condensation. With There was a time when they used magnetic traps, moth traps. They were for 10 years that people thought that was the, uh, the hottest things. But it turns out that tweezers is superior to the uh, moth trap in almost every, in every respect. And there are some fabulous experiments that have gone on uh, using superconductivity, uh, uh, superfluidity, spin, uh, spin, make, spin, uh, 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 atomic, sp you're seeing uh, 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 optical vortices, and so on. But uh, you know, I, uh, I'll, I'll just my, this is my last sentence. Uh, I, uh, I used to talk with Jim, and I, and I told him, you know, Jim, you're one of the only guys I ever knew who deserved three and maybe more for Nobel Prizes, but won none. So Jim just smiled. And then I remembered that little sign that you see there we, that was shown here. He had this little sign in the office that said, there's no limit to what you can accomplish if you don't worry about who's getting all the credit. Okay? So I think that Jim Gordon, Jim Gordon was a was a was a great friend, a great colleague, a great scientist, and especially a great human being. Okay.